раз знает. Well, I, I, the, the Dutch are the tallest in the world as a people, and even in the Netherlands, I'm considered quite tall. And uh, so, yes. Um, all right. Well, I'm very pleased to be here, like I said. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and giving this talk. Um, it will last about 13 minutes, and I have this timer, which I will start now. Um, I will dedicate my talk to the contents of the book that I co-authored together with Karl Beckmann, Beyond Democracy. There's also an Italian edition. There are 13 languages uh, in which it is available, and uh, the Italian edition is Oltre la Democrazia. Um, in the book, we explain why democracy uh, does not lead to tolerance and liberty and prosperity, as often as uh, people think, but to social conflict and runaway public spending, and uh, tyrannical or totalitarian government. Uh, we explain why it is both immoral and impractical, and why it leads to so many problems. Um, let's, uh, as a matter of interest, who have you voted in the last general elections? And, and don't be shy, uh, we're among friends now. <laughs> so I voted. No, no one did vote? Oh, that's, that's remarkable. Well, uh, that's good, maybe, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I voted for the Libertarian Party, and I was on the list myself. I didn't want to be on the list. I did not expect anything from uh, voting for my party. It was just because a friend was m of mine was on the list, and he said, well, please vote for me, Frank, because I'm so afraid that I will get zero votes. <laughs> And uh, at least I gave him one, and he gave me one. <laughs> I got more than one, luckily, but of course it didn't matter at all. Well, in this talk, I will try to explain why democracy, uh, uh, w what the problems are that many current Western democracies suffer from. And secondly, I will explain why there's a clear trend in these problems. It's not just accidental or temporary, and, and why these problems are connected, are caused uh, by the uh, democracy itself, by its principles and by its dynamics. And thirdly, I will come up with an alternative based on individual liberty. But before I continue, I would like to make a few disclaimers. We really criticize democracy very strongly in the book, and I do so too in my talk. But it doesn't mean that I want to abolish democracy. I mean, people should be free to live in whatever system they like. And if that's democracy, I am very fine with that. I, I don't want to withhold democracy from people. And secondly, I do not think that democracy is better or worse than dictatorship. And, um, and I don't think that it's terrible to live in a democracy, for instance. It's, you know, I'm, I'm not saying there will be disaster. I'm just saying, well, there are many problems, as we can see now, in, in democracies. And more democracy is not the answer. Democracy is the cause. All right, let's go to graph two. Uh, I will show you, let, let's see what problems the current democracies have. And these are long-term trends. Uh, this is the rise of government spending in the last 100 years. Uh, we had uh, general suffrage, uh, general voting in the last 100 years in the Netherlands, for instance. And in these hundred years, the, the taxes or government spending, which is pretty much the same, uh, rose from 12% to 50%. And this, these are until 2009. And um, um, 2009, and of course, after that, uh, the politicians have raised the, the taxes again. Jolly, jolly, jolly. Um, I didn't expect anything else, by the way. Um, so. Um, yes, so there's this is the average of the major Western democracies. And let's compare them to Hong Kong and Singapore, non-democracies. Well, Hong Kong 22% and Singapore uh, around 16%. This is an interesting graph too, unfortunately in German. 
uh, I gave this talk in German to Staatsausgaben. Uh, here we can Switzerland compared to the other countries. And you can see the trend is pretty much the same, but you know, not as fast and not as severe. But the trend is uh, up, up, and up. These are numbers from The Economist. Uh, this is an interesting graph, too. This uh, is the regulation of in the United States, the Federal Code of Regulation and the tax code. It has increased 200-fold. They try to manage our lives on the level of, you know, on a detailed level. I mean, how we eat, what we eat, where we eat, uh, when we smoke, how we smoke, uh, where we work, what we earn, uh, what we do, uh, what professions we can have. Everything is managed up to the detail. And this is an example, you know, this indicates, and this is so-called the land of the free, huh? This is the land of the free. Very little regulation in the United States. <laughs> it's a bit ridiculous. Uh, so uh, this is all intrusions to, uh, you know, individual freedom, of course. If they tell me what to do through their books, well, this is pretty much the same in, in, in Europe, of course. I mean, um, well, another graph, the third, is the expanding welfare state. As we can see now, in, in the United States, we have Obamacare, which adds more. This is U.S. again, United States, a land with a country with a very minor welfare state. <laughs> well, this indicates the um, a number, the percentage of families or households that receive some kind of government benefit. It has risen in the last 30 years, and it's expanding and expanding. And this is official number, so impressive, don't you think? I think it is. I mean, it really, it's, a, it's not a, a blip or something. It's really a long-term trend. This is the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar, same as with the Swiss franc. Well, Swiss franc is a bit, bet bit, sorry, a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bitch, it's true, <laughs> but the French friend, <laughs> it's a bit, bit better. Uh, well, of course, uh, the United States democracy cannot really protect the value of our currency. That's, that's pretty clear. But I think this is a very interesting graph, too. It's from The Economist, and this uh, indicates that um, a growing welfare state, growing regulation, and growing taxes well, they seem to cause fewer growth. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this is proof. I cannot prove these things. It's impossible to prove. But there's a correlation, and I think there's a causation too. As you can see, uh, these are major, uh, underneath you see the major uh, Western European and uh, United States democracy. And this is the average growth of the GDP um, corrected for inflation in the last five decades. And you can see this continuously lowering. And there's a funny thing. Last month, we had, no, no, last quarter in the Netherlands, <laughs> it was so funny, um, I saw on television that uh, we were very happy because we had a growth of 0.1%. <laughs> and we said, oh, the, the way up is, we see the way up again. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, nowadays, now I understand politics and I understand democracy much better. I'm not frustrated anymore with politicians. I laugh at them. And, and I see the, the, the news and I say, oh, it's very funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you believe it yourself. Yeah. So, uh, well, as compared to Hong Kong, you could say, well, this has nothing, this has nothing to do with democracy because uh, uh, maybe because we become wealthier, we work less hard. Well, Singapore and Hong Kong, which are just as wealthy, they still grow 4 to 5% per year. So there's an enormous uh, faith in democracy. 15 years ago, I believed very strongly in democracy, and I thought it had export, qu export quality, not like the neocons, but uh, we should spread the idea. Uh, I didn't know much about democracy. I just believed what the politicians and the media and uh, the educational system had told me that democracy uh, was f fantastic, there was no alternative, and we thank our uh, peace and our wealth, our prosperity to democracy. I know much better now, I think. It's a world right uh, religion, I think. And but still, many, many people in the world, in the Netherlands, I see it. And 
undoubtedly also in Italy and Switzerland, many people, whether they are socialists or liberals or conservatives, uh, are disillusioned and dissatisfied with, with the outcome. I mean, it seems that most Democrats are not very, uh, you know, <laughs> are frustrated with the outcome of democracy. But somehow democracy is never the cause of these problems. And uh, this is uh, rather strange. And they sometimes say to me, well, this is not a true democracy. And I said, no, no, and they can't explain why not. And I said, well, this is really a democracy, a true democracy. It just doesn't work. So uh, what is the cause of that? Um, you, you people are disillusioned, like I said. And uh, on the bottom right corner, you have Mark Rutte, the minister pre prime minister of the, of the Netherlands. And he frustrated a lot of liberals. He was, uh, he was the right wing, I'm sure. And, uh, well, Hollande, of course, he disappointed, and Obama, he disappointed, too. And does that mean that we need to tweak the system a bit? Uh, you know, democracy is good, but if we tweak it a bit, then, then we'll be all right. Or did we vote for the wrong party? Do we need other politicians? Do we need politicians that have integrity and uh, intelligence, or, and they listen? Or is the system flawed? And I think the system is flawed. Uh, yeah, uh, it's very important, I think, and I stopped doing it, don't blame the politicians. Because even if they wanted to do it well, they couldn't. Because democracy is inherently flawed. Uh, it's inherently wrong. It can't work. Um, so stop expecting uh, anything good from them. It's better not to, you know, it's better for your heart. Don't get frustrated. I stopped doing it. And uh, I think most politicians actually are intelligent and have good intentions can't just work. And why is that? Why is it that democracy cannot work, in my opinion? Well, I think that is because uh, democracy is a form of collectivism. It's the idea, and this is not nonsense, uh, and listen to the experts. Karl Marx said democracy is the road to socialism. And um, uh, the United, S you know, the, the Socialist Party of the United States claims that democracy and socialism are one and indivisible. So uh, democracy, in my opinion, is the idea that we can and often must decide collectively on virtually everything in society together and that the outcome must be followed by everyone, also the people who are against it. In a democracy, the individual is subordinate to the wishes of the collective, just as with communism and fascism. And democracy leads to the same negative results as, as these two systems, but to a lesser extent, namely centralization, uh, bureaucracy, corruption, uh, everything becomes political, uh, less uh, diminishing freedoms, um, you name it. So let's look at uh, what are the dynamics. I'll show you about five. And the principles of democracy. Well, democracy has an in inbuilt building um, short-term outlook, and not only of politicians, but also of the citizens, because they know that whatever problems they create, whether it's because of overspending or, uh, you know, starting stupid laws or something, then they say, well, uh, our successes have to deal with the problem. And their successes, of course, have the same incentive, perverse incentive. Say, well, let my successes deal with it, but let me get the benefits of overspending. And this is, and this is, these are old numbers. Uh, Obama is right on course to beat uh, Bush, uh, George W. Bush. Uh, he was a big spender, but already since uh, the last few years, Obama has uh, added a four trillion to the, uh, I think, four and a, to the public debt. Well, uh, democracy is often regarded as a system to protect the people against the government. And I think this is not correct. It doesn't really protect them. But it's, it doesn't protect one citizen against the other citizen either. In a democracy, everybody tries to live at the expense of others. And we can see that in this cartoon. They say, I want this, and I want them to pay for it. And if you listen to the news, you can often hear that, well, implicitly. 
And democracy is a giant redistribution machine, and not necessarily from the rich to the poor, but from the productive and the uh, responsible to the unproductive and the irresponsible. It makes legal what is normally illegal. Taking money from people, from someone else, is immoral. But if you have the, uh, the majority, then suddenly it becomes okay and moral. And this, of course, this redistribution creates social tensions because the winner takes all in a democracy. And people who vote differently, you can no notice that, they are the enemy. But people who buy a different TV than yours are not the enemy. So in the market, we don't have this antagonism. Well, it's also not a very good uh, way to uh, control or other direct or check government. If politicians start wars under false pretenses or break election promises or print money till there are no trees left standing, uh, they never end up in jail. Democratic politicians can hardly be held accountable. And of course, lobby groups influence politicians and politics more than people are aware of. There are so many sweet deals between uh, certain industries and sectors or unions uh, and politicians that we hardly know of, but they take our money and our liberty away. For instance, the, the financial system, they, they were bailed out with 700 billion, but the bakery on the corner of the street doesn't get anything. Well, democracy is considered to be uh, equated or equated often with uh, liberty, but of course this is nonsense. You are not free when the majority tells you what to do. You are free when you can spend your own money, the fruits of your labor, and uh, whatever you like to do with your own body. Liberty is about individual liberty. And our democracies do not offer uh, freedom of contract, for instance, between tenant and renter, or uh, physician and patient, or student and school, uh, customer and proprietor, um, marriage partners, they do not allow freedom of contract. They ne can not negotiate on the price and what kind of service or product is provided. And our democracies did not offer individual freedom either. In the United States, there are more than a million people in jail for, you know, uh, victimless crimes like selling drugs or using drugs or growing plants like marijuana. And of course, they take about 50% of our money away. In the Netherlands, as an example, well, as an ex ex exception, we are allowed to kill ourselves under government rules if we are very sick or something. But in most countries, this is not allowed, which is strange if your life does not belong to yourself. Also, one of the uh, misunderstandings of democracy is that it's often equated with prosperity. And th actually, the reverse is true. In India, we have the biggest democracy in the world, but it is poor and there's a lot of corruption. Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, on the other hand, are not democracies and they are wealthy and prosperous and, and peaceful. Well, the collectivism of democracy makes people behave in irrational ways because they can burden o others with the negative effects of their unwise decisions or actions. It's like going out to dinner with 100 people and deciding up front that you will split the bill evenly. Everyone has a very strong incentive to order that extra uh, dessert, mm -hmm. uh, 10 euros or 10 francs, uh, because he knows I will only have to spend 10 cents for that. But uh, because everyone has the same incentive, uh, the eventual, the final bill will be enormous, much higher than anyone would want. But no one can do anything about it. You're trapped in this tragedy of the commons, as economists say so. We know that, well, I think that prosperity, prosperity is a result of economic freedom, of low taxes, little regulation, uh, property rights and not democracy. 
often have always come to the alternative. People often think there is no alternative to democracy. And this, of course, is a bit strange. Uh, they say, well, there's an alternative, but it's a dictatorship. But we don't use democracy in companies. If democracy was really a good way of deciding uh, things, then we should see many democratically run companies, but we don't see any. We don't use democracy in our family, generally. We don't use it in science. And we don't do uh, use it when we do our daily groceries. That would be absurd. But, gen but strangely, we do use it when we want to buy health insurance or something, or uh, when it's uh, democratically decided upon. So the alternative to voting with your pencil, what we do in a democracy, is to vote with your feet, what we do in a market. And the alternative to majority rule is self-rule. And the alternative to buying a car democratically is not that a dictator will buy it for you, but that you buy it yourself. So, therefore, we need then decentralization to the level of the uh, province, of the municipality, and ideally to the level of the individual. And, well, I'm here in Switzerland. I always use Switzerland as an example. And, of course, almost every Swiss citizen is probably dissatisfied with the Swiss system in a way. But you have to realize that I'm not explaining this as an ideal, uh, I'm just as an improvement over, the, for instance, uh, the system in m the other European countries, like in the Netherlands. And Switzerland is an example of a more decentralized country. And it's also one of the most successful countries on Earth. And it's also one of the most democratic. But it's not an argument in favor of democracy. I think the success of Switzerland lies in its fragmented, decentralized system. And of course, this is under threat, this system, and it's being eroded. More and more centralization is going on, as I have understood correctly. So, but Switzerland uh, is not part of any big bloc like the EU. And still it is successful. Our politicians in the Netherlands say, no, no, we should be part of the big blocks and to protect ourselves against China and Russia and the United States. Uh, there are 26 cantons, uh, and they have, on average, uh, 250,000 inhabitants, which is rather small. And they compete. They have a lot of relatively large amount of autonomy on the uh, in, in sectors like uh, taxes or healthcare, education, and there are 2,600 municipalities. And in the Netherlands, for instance, we have 410 municipalities, and they have no autonomy whatsoever, or hardly. And we have 70 million inhabitants. Uh, we, have, uh, we have provinces, but you pay the same taxes, and you have the same education, and the same healthcare in any of them. It doesn't matter. So in the Netherlands, we cannot vote with their feet. And the Swiss can vote with their feet a bit. Uh, so uh, for this uh, for this decentralization, we need secession, the right to secede. Unfortunately, this is not allowed, not even if you want to start your own democracy. And there are currently only 200 countries for 7 billion people, and that's far too few. And I think the right to secede is the safety valve against big government, just as the right to start a new company is the safety valve in a free market. And uh, Switzerland, in the case of the Canton of Jura, uh, has shown that secession can be done peacefully and gradually and successfully. In 1997, it's Jura seceded from the Canton of Bern, and, well, everybody was happy. Another example is south of Sudan, uh, that seceded from North Sudan in 2012, and Czechoslovakia in 1993, that split up. So I'm in favor of a market for governance, for governmental services, like uh, justice and security and uh, defense. And these are governance providers. 
they can have shareholders. They don't have to have a democracy, like one man, one vote. Uh, the influence can be based on position, on share, uh, on merits. And they might have a profit motive uh, and a cost-cutting incentive. And we know that we have uh, cheap bread uh, at high quality because we have competition between um, bread makers, between bakers. And with a market for governance, we, might ha we probably have lower taxes and better um, governance. And we, all wi we will also see an innovation in politics because of this competition. And this can anything be, uh, I don't know how these sh countries should be run. It could be anything between no democracy at all, like uh, Dubai and uh, Switzerland. I'm fine with any of them. If they have fine customers, then it's good. So we would have to have, we would see more of a contractual society. Currently, no one has a contract with their government stating, oh, yeah, you have to pay this for this amount of time and you will get this in return. Uh, they can change the rules as, as the game is going on. And you have no legal certainty. But I, I, when there would be more competition between countries and governments, then they would offer a certain contract, security. They say, no, 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 you alone will pay for the next or next five or ten years this amount of tax and you will get this in return. So we need startup countries. Uh, one example, for instance, is Shenzhen. It's not a country, but it's a special economic zone that started in 1980 and had a lot of economic liberty. And now it's, it was a fisher, fisher village in uh, 1980, and now it's a huge city with about seven or eight million inhabitants. Um, but also countries like Dubai, which is not really a country either, but doesn't matter, and Hong Kong and Singapore. I don't know how many countries there should be. And I don't know how they should be run. And I don't have to know. I don't know how to run a, a car factory, but I know that when we allow everyone to start a car factory and decide on the price, whatever they like, or whatever the, mo the model, then we get the best cars for the lowest price with the most variety. And people expect me to come up with a certain, you know, a structure, like say, no, Frank, tell us how government should do that instead of democracy. And I say, I don't know. It should be, you know, whatever you like. Like, I don't know how to run a car company. I don't know how it should be managed. I know there should be free competition, and I, that's what I'm in favor for, free competition for, uh, between governments. So we need thousands of governments, or maybe you should not call them any governments anymore. So don't we need a special, a spontan uh, uh, special um, centralized organization for this market of governance? And I don't think it is necessary. Because around us, we see many examples of spontaneous voluntary order. And this is a flow, uh, flock of birds uh, on the left. And on the right is a map of the internet. It's pretty much spontaneous order. The free market is a, an example of spontaneous order. When I was first introduced to the internet, I, I, my immediate uh, question was, oh, who owns this? I mean, what company is this? And I said, there's no company. Uh, I couldn't believe that. Uh, that there was no company involved, that there was spontaneous order. Because before that, you had America Online, CompuServe, big companies that provide their own networks. And they, stood not, they did not stand a chance against the free model of the Internet. It has proven to be very robust and beneficial to society. Bitcoin is also a great example of spontaneous order. You can hardly believe it could ever work, but it's apparently it does. And maybe it will collapse in a way, but we've, we have to learn from that. And something else will come up. But up till now, it's remarkably uh, robust. So I think government is organized chaos, whereas the free market is poetic or uh, chaotic order. So now I come to the conclusion. I will write, uh, I will say this. Democracy is the will of the people. Every morning I am stunned to read in a newspaper what I want. Um, well, I think it's important 
that democracy is not freedom, but it's collectivism. It is a system in which power is reduced and in which power is concentrated, in which millions of different decisions by individuals are reduced to a few one-size-fits-all decisions by politicians. As a citizen, you have the right to one negligible vote. And in return, the majority gets the right to run your life and to spend your money. It is obviously a very bad deal. If we want more freedom and prosperity, we need not look at politics. We cannot expect a positive change through democracy. Freedom-loving people need to demolish this absurd belief in democracy. And best is to criticize its fundamentals and not its impl implementation. Once we have more competing countries, we can vote with our feet and make democracy irrelevant. We have to, therefore, forward the idea of secession. And I think in this market for governance, there will be a world with more choice, lower taxes, more legal certainty, and more individual liberty. Thank you. <laughs>